with all these uh, these people coming in the chat, I will put the CAPTCHA on. So you guys are not robots. We are definitely convinced about that. Okay, so just a quick round of introduction. Um, I would like to start directly like in the image from the left side. So Morten, I'll pass it to you, sir. Yeah, I think it's great to have everybody on the call today. As, as we kind of indicated, lots and lots of people joining today. So pleasure having everybody here. My name is Morten. I'm the CEO and founder of Heimdall. Uh, so happy to have a lot of you on the call. <clears throat> a lot of uh, trusted Heimdall supporters here. Uh, we've luckily grown to, uh, to about 15, maybe 16,000 customers now using the platform globally, uh, which we're really proud of. So uh, thank you for your support, everybody. Thank you, sir. Robertino, you'll be next. Yeah. Uh, based on the image. With a very short one. Hi, my name is Robertino. I'm the head of global process engineering. And from former webinars, you know, I love the, being the part of the hacker. So as you can see today, we will have a lot of fun. Pleasure to meet you. Thank you, Robertino. Alex, I'm passing it to you. Thank you. My name is Alex. I'm from Amex DR Engineer. And uh, I'm happy to be here, and I cannot uh, wait to present you some great stuff today. Thank you. And last but not least, uh, my name is Andre, and uh, Alex, thank you for muting. Perfect. My name is Andre. I'm the cybersecurity community leader here at Heimdall, but you guys already know me, so I'll just move forward. And another thing that you usually don't know when you join a webinar is who is hosting this webinar. Well, this webinar is hosted by Heimdall Security, which is a leading European cybersecurity vendor. And hopefully soon we will be a leading global cybersecurity vendor. <laughs> uh, Heimdall Security is originating from Denmark, from Copenhagen. We have literally the most robust XDR suit in the market right now because we cover more than just the regular EDR components and a few more extra like cloud and so on. Uh, now, all of these products that you can see on the screen, which we will talk about because you guys uh, placed so many questions about them, connect to one platform. Moreover, we have a dedicated 24-7 managed extended detection and response team that collects all this data and makes sure all our customers are secure. Uh, now, with the introductions out of the way, I would like to start the session by asking you guys a question. People that have joined our sessions previously know that we play cyber trivia, which means I'm asking you a question, you guys try to guess the response, and the people that will be closest to the response will win a Heimdall Home Premium license, which is basically uh, DNS security, encryption, AV, and patching for your home computer. And the question goes, let's see, what percentage of cyber attacks in 2023 had social engineering as a component and i know that you guys know where the question box is so you know where to write to us let's see raul says 56 percent uh, are we allowed to answer andre can i get a, a heimdall home license uh, sure thing sir you don't know the answer so yeah why not okay we have a lot of people coming in 90 90 65 70 let's see you guys are typing so fast, I cannot see. 95. Let's see, did anyone uh, place the mark over here? And I believe 95 is the winner. If nobody went further, it's 98%. And this is as a component, not just as an entry method. And Putra also placed 99. Uh, so I believe that uh, Putra is the closest, but 95 will also uh, be the winner because Putra, you answered a bit later than uh, than expected, but no worries, both of you guys get the winner. And this is coming from Firewall Times via PurpleSec. Uh, they made a report. So why are we asking about social engineering? The question about social engineering is due to the fact that we will have right now a live exercise of social engineering with the aim of deploying ransomware. And we will have Robertino as the attacker because he loves to be the hacker. Uh, then we have myself as the victim. I will be the naive user that presses on stuff before they actually check. And we will have Alex, which is a new joiner in our webinar. So guys, if he has a bit of emotions, a bit of nervousness, please uh, uh, bear with him for a second. He will play the defender role. Now, with that being said, Robertino would like to present this particular social engineering project to you guys. 
Well, what's yeah, AKA Ronaldo in this example? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kind of. Um, okay, so let's start. Well, I have I'm in a hacker group and I have one job to do. Usually we are signing projects. So that means everybody is one person is responsible for hacking or one target. So I was assigned to Heimdall. Well, we have a time frame, we have a budget, and I have to figure out how to get into Heimdall. It was quite difficult because as a security provider, security company, Heimdall is very hard to hack. So we, did, we could not get them with technical stuff. So we decided, like in other companies also, we are looking for a person that is exposed. So the decision was either we are using the CEO or somebody who is exposed on webinars, etc., who is socially very active. And so we decided, well, Andre would be the perfect target because through his webinars, who his communication patterns, etc., he is a perfect target. We had already nine attempts on doing that, but now we found out that there, there is a webinar and we were listening to it and we had now a very narrow time window to attack him. So what did we do? First of all, <laughs> we targeted Andre. Well, what is, it, what is his social profile? You see, he works with a lot of people in his job. He's very communicative. He is especially, that is important. He's getting, of, due to his work, a lot of feedback and information from outside. So it is very common that he is getting emails from other persons, asking questions, giving feedback, etc. And the other side, he, du during his webinars, he shows a very helpful, very friendly voice. He's dedicated to support the people. Perfectly fitting for the, uh, the person to attack, the, the victim itself in a perfect description. Now we found on the schedules of Andre that on the 5th he has um, a webinar and we were listening to that. We, are an we were analyzing his previous webinars and now we were just recording this one. Um, we also took part of it, to be honest, as partner. And so, okay, fine. We get some information out of that. Here, um, Mark made one big mistake, to be honest. L we were the lucky guys. He was mentioning to give feedback to Andre as fast as possible after the webinar on the same business day. <clears throat> or latest at the 7th, 7th of December. That gave us a time window where we can act. So what we did, well, we looked at the webinar, we saw in the webinar, that is the reason why we recorded that, the details catching that there was a tap with Andre's private email address. I will tell you why that is important. The Andre is working at Heimdall. Heimdall has a very sophisticated email security product, so we cannot trigger that, we cannot get through it, but we stopped and he has a Gmail account. So that opened up for us a door to penetrate. And that is exactly where we are continuing. So we had the email address. We found on, the, on one of the partners who was taking care of that, uh, was participating right there, a uh, generic like info at marketing, perfect. So we had an email address, we had a target, we had a time frame. We could bypass right now email security from Heimdall because it was going to Gmail. And to be honest, Cardio ID's protection was pretty poor. So they used no multi-factor authentication. The email server was responding on port 25, standard SMTP, no encryption, nothing like that. And with a brute force attack on this genuine account, to be honest, you see it right here, marketing one, two, three, question mark not very creative to be honest and then we added of course some credibility to the whole stuff on linkedin we checked cardio id we found jack jackson we found who else else is working in the company and we saw oh jack jackson and is mark's boss that's pretty cool so now to let's say to um flatter andre a little bit to open him up we used the boss and giving the boss the opportunity to thank Andre. So that is the second step. So not only 
the direct link between two persons like Jack, um, like Mark? No, we are using the boss of Mark. That is good for the ego of the victim. So if he is feeling flattered, of course, he's more communicative and is easy, easier mm. directed to accepting an email. So I will send him an email, email on that. In that case, let's switch to my part. Andre, you really need to stop uh, being such a starstruck uh, person. You know? <laughs> I, I'm actually curious how many people will try to socially engineer me after this. After webinar. the call. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's absolutely. So you see, um, due to the fact that I'm a liar and I'm a hacker, I've chosen, of course, Loki, the god of stories, and I tried to find out more about Andre. So you see, I was looking at his webinars, listening to him, finding his name, looking for LinkedIn, etc., and taking that all parts and the information about cardio ID I had, I was creating just with chat GPT, which is very helpful in that case. You don't even need um, fraud GPT or something like that. I created an email that looks like that. Hi, Andre. I hope yada yada webinar report password and to be I explained also why I'm using his Gmail address and then you see webinar reporting why are doing that not attaching well you know when I'm attaching a file the problem is with Google it's scanning it of course I have malicious software inside of that report but well I want to avoid that so I was sending a link to him and also explain why that happens and that is the email I'm sending to Andre and also in this scenario you see i created a file header an email address etc so i have everything in place copying that stuff right here to andre and now i need his gmail you see andre h correct a dot ah wait a second i have it somewhere i have a document <laughs> That is the you only be thing a good, that uh, a good hacker if you wouldn't, right? Exactly. Everything is prepared somewhere. Just need to know where. That is always the point. Just give me a second. And that so you see it's definitely live. I sent it somewhere, but I didn't um store it. Here, hi Andre. Here we got it. Um copy the email address and take it from here so you see i had already some approaches on andre they were not successful and go here to the new message copy the email address paste webinar feedback as good good, good thing in this example andre that we know you're going to click it but <laughs> <laughs> But uh, actually, I think the overall message is here that it, it doesn't take a lot to be quite convincing and, and kind of come up with a decisive email that is convertible, so to say, or clickable. Um, so yeah, this is exactly the example we're trying to prove here. So, yeah. <clears throat> now you see everything is in place. I have also the header and everything like Cardio ID would have it maybe, just taking it from LinkedIn, collecting some data. And then I just send it to Andre. That's it. And now let's see Perfect. what is happening on the other side. Now let's see what the victim does. So I'll just uh, share my screen again with everyone, sharing monitor one. And let's see what happens with uh, this particular email. I'm waiting for the email, which will just arrive in two seconds. Because again, what Robertino did made sure that Google's email security will not be able to catch this. He sent a link. Moreover, he sent it in a password protected um, archive so that not even the browser can actually stop the download, right? So I believe you all can see my screen with the email, right? So yeah, we see again, that. just looking at that profile, right? Andre just had this particular webinar. He's very excited. Um, and uh, uh, Andre's colleague, Mark, that did the webinar with him from Cardio ID, did the mistake of tagging some people on LinkedIn, right? So let's read the email. Hi, Andre. 
I hope my email finds you well. First and foremost, massive thank you for the fantastic webinar. Of course, this stroke my ego. So I'm continuing reading. Your insights were truly uh, invaluable. Unfortunately, Mark, the person that worked with me on the webinar, couldn't reach out personally as he's under the weather due to a food poisoning. So now they made me empathic, right? They made me more emotional. Mark has a problem. I'm so sorry for Mark. He got food poisoning, yada, yada, yada. Uh, he wanted to extend his gratitude for the efforts and share the webinar directly. So here it is, webinar report link. So I don't know what this link is, um, go where this link is going with the password. I know your plate is probably overflowing. Again, this is a good information, but we have an exciting opportunity. John Eric, which they took from the tag on LinkedIn, right? This is dangerous. Be very careful when you tag people on LinkedIn. CEO of Fortune 500 company is eager to connect. That's the only thing I need to see, right? In this particular moment, I will actually take this particular link and I will open it, right? Because rarely a CEO of a Fortune 500 company is eager to connect with you, right? So when we go in the browser, we will just have the file downloading on the computer, which will take just a few seconds. Okay, let's see why it isn't downloading. Oh, it downloaded, perfect. So we have this particular file. I always work from a folder, right? For each webinar I do with each partner, I have a folder. So I will extract this here. I need a password, of course. So I'll go back to this particular email, grab the password. And experts and now, on this call will probably say, that's quite statistically unlikely to happen that you uh, go this far. But the uh, the main fact is that many compromises happen this way through an email, uh, simply because the user is not educated enough. Anyway, I'll I'll let you I'll let you crack on, Andre. Thank you, sir. Yeah, but, but basically, a lot of planets have aligned so that this goes through so smoothly, right? But nevertheless, you have an Excel file in front of you, right? Let's see what happens when we click it. So it's opening. I want to see my webinar stats, and I want to filter. So I'll enable editing. This has just enabled the document. In this particular moment, even the document became a bit unresponsive. But why is that? Because right now, this document is not just doing the normal purpose of the document, it just enabled malware. And for the sake of this demonstration, we made this visible, but this never happens in front of your eyes. It's always running in the background, right? So if we look in the background, let me just show you what happens in the background. A folder like this will be deployed on your computer, but it will be hidden. You will not see it, right? This folder will have self-executing uh, software, which is malware, right? Malicious software. And if we look at this particular file, let me go back and open this in a new window. Okay, we have this file. Imagine that this file is your computer, your network, right? All the computers on your network, all the data, all the valuable things you have. And let's open again this particular virus, which normally it just does the job in the back end. And let's click on ransomware, right? And let's see what happens. Let's see how fast this computer becomes encrypted. As you can see, it will take just a minute to encrypt over 170 files that I have over here, or 70 files, right? And basically during this time even if i try to stop it it's not responding right because it initialized in the memory i can literally not stop it i can close it but that doesn't mean that this will stop and i'll just scroll over here so that you guys can see anything anybody wants to add while we're looking at this very dark type of scenario when things are encrypting <clears throat> Nope, nobody wants to say anything. Jens, uh, Yane is saying, luckily Heimdall has a ransomware module, which is disabled for this particular exercise, and we will see exactly why. Now, you while also, this you also, you also notice here, Andre, I think a relevant uh, metric here, you notice the uh, encryption is happening quite slow here uh, in this example, but you'll have different types of ransomware. Some move really quickly, some disrupt the file structure. In this example, it can go under the radar by going slow as well. So it depends a little bit on the protection type you have. Anyway, sorry, Andrew, go ahead. This is, uh, actually, that's a, that's a very good addition, sir. I wanted to say that at the end, 
this is a medium type encryption so it took one minute and 20 seconds on the clock i actually have the timer over here and it encrypted 70 uh, 70 71 critical assets but imagine what happens with hyper encryption you don't even get to see how it actually changes everything on your computer and in this moment i am hacked right I, they have my data they have uh, encrypted it now Luckily, I have Heimdall MXDR. Even if I don't have ransomware encryption protection, I believe that Alex over here received an alert or something. So I'll pass it to Alex. Yeah, I, I'm checking right now to see exactly, and I will show you guys right away how we work and how we can see exactly where we can find all the details. So just for everybody's context again, Alex is playing kind of the role of the defender. Uh, so we're trying to now spot what's what's going on on uh, on Andre's computer. Sorry, go ahead, Alex. Okay, thank you. So I'm I think you can see my screen, Ryan, right? Yeah, yeah, we see it. Okay, so basically I will need first of all to ask usually the customer what is the name of the company first of all in order for me to to search for him. Let's say that the name of the company I find it already. So I will check and see exactly what is happening in the products and everything. So I will click on the products and I will click on the endpoint detection to see here. But I observe that uh, our client doesn't have the ransomware encryption protection activated. So for the sake of the audience, usually we activate this kind of protection for free, even if he doesn't have it for the whole investigation in order for us to see what exactly is happening. So I will go ahead and activate, give me a few moments. Okay, so I activate the module right now. I will update right away. And now if I will refresh, it's loading. And ho hopefully this will also show how live the platform is because we'll ho hopefully we'll see the, uh, the ransomware module being enabled in a couple of seconds. Yeah. yeah. I will refresh right now. And as you can see, I have the ransomware encryption already here. So I want to see all the, the problems that I have with all the endpoints. So usually I will go here and check all the endpoints that they have problem. And I need to ask usually the customer, which is the problematic endpoints to say like that, which one he recognized and he has, he took the, the ransomware. Let's say for this test that this is the one sales de demo 04, and I will go on this one. And here, usually, you can see all the details or information about the endpoint. So we can see all the things, and also we can see the top detection that he had in the last time. In order for me, usually when I'm, I know that it's a, an encryption like this, in order for me to not spread to other endpoints, I will need to isolate the uh, endpoint. So I will do this right away. And just to specify for people here, in this sure. example, of course, the, the customer didn't proactively have a, a SOC monitoring because if it was SOC monitoring, we'd be monitoring the account. So in this example, the customer would have called us uh, asking for help on uh, on a after the fact ransomware example you can say exactly may i ask if that happens often alex it happens yeah it happens i know i know i uh, we just had a case like this i'm working on a case already regarding this ransomware so i already know what to do and i know that most of the time we need to activate and we will tell them that uh, i will tell you also to the audience right here what i will need to do Usually I'm going after I isolate the, the endpoint because I don't want to spread to other endpoints. So it must be isolated. I need to go and check the group policies a little bit to see exactly if everything is in order and what I will need to do. Yeah, just for the for the less technical on the call, I think it's helpful to explain that the isolation basically puts the machine in a complete restriction mode from talking to other machines on the network. So you don't get a spread uh, across the network estate, and all of these controls are directly available here for the for the SOC operator, uh, basically. 
thank you for that ad. It, it was good. <laughs> Okay, so uh, basically, I'm going to the endpoint detection because I want to go straight to the um, to the ransomware encryption settings, and I'm clicking. You see the tabs here for all the modules, and I'm clicking here on the ransomware encryption protection, and I need to activate it because I want to be active. Even if I activate the module, I will need to activate also for the endpoint. So in order for the grab policy to recognize that he has it already and it's active on the endpoint. And after that, I need to isolate on temper detection. I need also to use this, the same in order to not harm other endpoints on the network. And after this, I just need to click on update the group policy. You need you can select for all the if you have more group policies you can select for all of them you can specify which one let's say that you have five and they are, they have different names and different rules you can select for each one do you have to update with this policy or you can select for the current group policy depends in our situation I, I just want to change it only for this group policy so I will confirm it here. Okay so now. The endpoint is isolated. Everything is in order. I change the settings. So as you can see, everything is safe to say like that. Now, in order for us to investigate further, we will need some logs from the endpoint. So in order for us to do this, we connect remotely and we can extract the logs from our Heimdall. And also we can extract the logs, logs from the Windows event. And also we need a sample from the ransomware in order for the malware team analysis to see if they can decrypt the files and to see if we can save anything that it was harmed. Perfect. The, yeah, I just wanted to add one more thing that uh, after this, after we do all the this and everything will, will be okay. We will uh, send also a report to the companies with all the events that happen in order for us to inform them what, how exactly it happened. Thank you so much, Alex. Now let's change okay. the microphone so that we yeah. don't double the voice. Perfect, guys. By the way, I'm with Alex in the same uh, in the same office here. Uh, now, um, Alex, thank you for joining us. I know that you're actually in a high uh, priority case right now amongst uh, your colleagues. So in case you need to drop off, we totally understand. So do not worry about it. Uh, now, as conclusions to this, and I will just share my screen for a second now. As a conclusion to this, I wanted to add uh, just a second here. Perfect. You guys should see my screen in about uh, a few seconds. Please confirm. Yeah, we see it. We see it, Andre. Perfect. Perfect. As a conclusion, very important, guys, be very careful what you share on social media. Be very careful when somebody tags you or other colleagues from your work or any type of uh, professional event. Check. Uh, and do highlight to the person that does this that this is dangerous because people can now leverage that information and they can use it to attack you. Now, furthermore, be very careful when you click on links, when you kick, uh, when you open password protected files. If you need to open something like that and you really need to or you think that you need to, unzip the file and before opening it, run an antivirus scan on it. That can actually save your entire network. And in most of the cases, it will actually do. Uh, any conclusions after the attack from Morton or Robertino? Yeah, I just think on the other side, on the defensive side, if you notice how little activity our team had to do to actually kind of first of all isolate the machine, but then turn the defensive mechanisms on, uh, it's quite light touch. Uh, also why, of course, I think it's, uh, it's a great thing to actually utilize the platform, whether you're a customer, an MSP, or or, or internal team. It just makes a ton of sense. You get a lot of telemetry and a very easy actioning um, when when you do have an incident in place. But of course, it's much better to be uh, safe than sorry. So in this example, having some proactive measures in place is uh, is clearly what you should be doing for sure. Thank you. Anything from your side, Robert? You know, just following up your um uh, stuff. Be careful. It's not only LinkedIn. It is everything that you're doing on social media. If somebody is trying to connect you, um, you are leaving um, traces everywhere that can be abused. And that is the dangerous thing. And as Andre mentioned before, and also um, the social engineering part is the most important part because it is 
focusing on one specific person, the weakest element in the whole chain. And it is so easy to do, and it's just a few clicks at the end of the day, a little bit of chat GPT, as you've seen. And you get all the details and all the information. And the human factor is, beside all technology we can offer and protect you, it's still often the deciding one. Yeah. Thank you, Robert, yeah. for that addition. That's a great point. Uh, I think so, there's yeah. a couple of questions actually in the chat, Andrew, which I think are relevant to cover and as we go. I'll, I'll just take them very quickly. So uh, Sajid is raising a question, if the ransomware module had been enabled before the attack, would it have been prevented? Yes, it would. Uh, we certainly recommend also in that instance to have the, um, the isolate on tamper enabled. What happens then is because typically when, there, when the ransomware happens like this, in this example, Andre would typically have uh, administrator rights to run the file, uh, which means that um, that in this example, they will also start tampering with the protective mechanism of the product. And as soon as you do the tampering, basically you want the machine to be isolated. So uh, so that that's built into the product as well, that you can isolate it on tamper. And yes, to your question, Kent, uh, yes, the SOC team will pick this up automatically. And you can actually choose if you want them to action or if you just want them to flag it to you. Uh, so that's that's all selectable. What, how we um, uh, how we are supposed to act on it. Um, so that those are the uh, those two responses. And then Dushan just raised the question. Um, we have a malware team as well, Dushan. They act as a fallback. So if there is a successful encryption, they can also help investigate the the files uh, as well to see if they can be recovered. Uh, cool. I think we covered those. Andrew, shall we crack on to the next uh, next chunk of it? Perfect, perfect. Okay, so uh, again, somebody has a license, to, has a chance to win a Heimdall Security home license. What do you guys think is the percentage difference recorded for publicly disclosed ransomware breaches between first half of 2022 and first half of 2023? You can just say plus or minus and the percentage that you think. Let's see. Let's uh, see if people are alive. 320%, 96, plus, plus 200, plus 250, 60. Let's see, 169, 76, 90, 55. And I believe we have a winner with 50. It's actually 49%. Uh, and basically that, uh, that means that uh, ransomware actually grew, but at the same time, there's another interesting fact that I don't have on the screen right now, which is if you look at publicly disclosed attacks versus the attacks that were not disclosed, which were collected from the dark web, it's one to 4.7. So for each attack that has been publicly uh, disclosed by the company, there are other almost five attacks that are not being disclosed, are being kept under the rug. Uh, so, thank you for the audience responding to this one. Now, Morten, I'll pass it to you so that you can tell us what are your conclusions on 2023 and what mm -hmm. predictions and suggestions you have. Yeah, thank you, Andre. And uh, let's see if we can uh, try and move as swiftly as possible on these. But I think there's a lot of interesting uh, stuff that we can go through, uh, especially based on what we said last year would happen, what has actually happened, and then what we expect to happen in the, in the coming year. But let, let's get on with it. Uh, so let's start, of course, with the conclusions for 23. So we, we had a couple of high-level notions that we thought would be relevant for 2023. Those in the security community, I think, will recognize some of these for sure. Uh, I had, over the last couple of years, had a number of healthy debates with Gartner uh, about the, uh, the point solutions. It's very interesting to hear that Gartner, you know, until recently said, e even until 2022, said point solutions are the way forward, kind of best of breed will continue to stay until the kind of mid-22 when it all turned around on a plate, and then all of a sudden 75% of all customers will unify, which is exactly what we've been saying the, the three years before. Uh, and I continue to kind of say point solution will die off. I do believe we started to see that happening. A lot of our customers have kind of unified the platform around Heimdall. Others have uni around, uh, unified around other things. So this is certainly a trend I would say has been uh, I wouldn't say successfully completed, but certainly what has what has happened in the in the past year. Then for those customers, as you do unify, and and then one of the reasons for unifying is a, a is of course the increased need for automation. So as attacks increase in complexity and speed, you need more 
automation to respond more visibility. Um, and that has certainly in my book also gone up in, in, in importance. That, of, that is of course a subjective view, but I certainly believe we can tick the box there as well and say, yes, uh, that has happened. Uh, then for kind of the uh, MSPs being uh, a prime supply chain target, that's certainly something we've seen. We just copy pasted in a recent one here at the bottom. Uh, so we can certainly take that box as well uh, because that, that has just happened a, a number of times across 2023 and uh, that we're certain will also continue to happen going forward, uh, but in a slightly different uh, state. And then uh, my last prediction for last year was attackers will get a lot bolder. Uh, I think they've certainly gotten a lot bolder uh, than they were in 2022. And just looking here at the bottom, we just copied in a few uh, recent ones as well uh, from uh, from Lockbit. Uh, these ransomware attackers are getting more and more bold. Uh, they're getting smarter uh, using AI now. Uh, there's a lot of trends uh, where we just need to remember, as I've said many times, dating, I think, all the way back to 2018, Ransomware attackers, in this case, Lockbit, operated as if they were a business uh, and you are their number one target. So they'll do anything they can to make a, a good buck off you. Uh, and that's exactly what's happening. So we need to stay very vigilant here. Uh, and this is exactly what has happened. So I think that sums up 2023 quite well. Uh, if there are any questions, by the way, Andrew, now I can't see the, the question box, but if we do take any along the way, uh, let, let's just cover them off as we as we go. No worries, sir. And I'll I, just uh, respond in the, in the chat for everybody when uh, when they ask a question. Super, great stuff. So let let's move on then to how we see kind of uh, the market panning out. I would say as a whole, I think there's like a few tendencies people need to be aware of, uh, which is driving the trends of the market. Uh, as people on the call here might recognize, so I happily take some questions from you if uh, if you do or if you don't. Uh, I think there's a good debate around these. So first one being the cybersecurity resources scarcity. What is that kind of driving? Uh, there's a few trends coming from that. One, of course, we're seeing a high lack of qualified personnel in IT. I think, I hope everybody on the call can recognize that. It might be in some countries that it's not kind of fully impacted, but certainly in Western Europe and the US, this is a big problem, uh, finding good qualified IT and IT security resources. Um, clearly also, people are kind of maximizing impact. So you want to try and get more from less spend. That's certainly also a scarcity resource being driven there. If you kind of unfold on that and move forward, that's driving a number of key trends, which we've kind of tried to map out on the screen, uh, which is kind of leading to companies having lack of internal IT and cybersecurity. Uh, people are outsourcing. Uh, the, uh, the quality personnel, so to say, is increasing in cost, which I think also people on this call will recognize that that is a a pretty common problem. Uh, and then on the other side of things, uh, you kind of cut spend on IT and cyber. That doesn't apply to all organizations. So we see bigger organizations are actually spending slightly more, but it's especially the smaller organizations are actually tending to spend less, uh, in, especially in this kind of condensed economic climate. So um, something, something to be aware of uh, there for sure, which is driving a further trend, <laughs> which really, kind of leads into how we're thinking about 2024, how we're trying to develop the product. Uh, so first of all, if you look at the MSPs, they're growing still very steadily and MSSPs are growing very steadily as well. We're seeing about 17% <clears throat> increase on their revenue year on year, which certainly means more of you on this call are offloading um, your, your resources, and your IT to them in an increasing fashion. That's then also driving another very interesting dynamic uh, which is then kind of leading on to the, uh, because MSPs are growing at a pace where they are also not able to kind of get quality resource, what many of you require from the MSP is typically actually not getting fulfilled. Uh, so then also for Heimdall, it becomes a big demand to deliver uh, well-equipped solutions to the MSP so they can actually supply the right IT security products at the right time uh, to end customers as well. So that those are some very interesting dynamics. Um, if we move on from that, then if you look on the other side of the table, on the attacker side, and this I think is really a place where you want to get your ears out and pay a lot of attention. We talked about it a couple of times, but there's some new trends coming across here as well. So if you look at your own business and then you look at how a cyber crime, uh, cyber criminal, sorry, would, would, would think about their business, 
there are many similarities, but it's been uh, increasingly similar recently, I'll say. So first of all, because they collect so much money, <clears throat> they need to, uh, in many cases, launder the money, of course, which would go through the, the finance team. But then if you look at how they run the uh, the attacks, they typically be split into what we call bulk attacks, and then you'd have some targeted attacks as well. Those require a little bit different level of sophistication, just like in your organization, you could have, uh, if you're running a production line, uh, you could have one production line running kind of mainstream things. If you're Coca-Cola, then you have one running the Coca-Cola factory. But then in many examples, Coca-Cola also owns other breweries or do other tappings, such as beer could be one. So then those would be smaller, more targeted functions where you tap certain types of beer. For example, Carlsberg being a great example. Carlsberg does both Coca-Cola tapping here in the Nordics, but they also do, of course, the Carlsberg beer. Um, so if you divide it like that, it's very similar in an attacker's uh, business. But then we're also recently seeing the, the PR division coming out. On the bulk attack side, you'll typically have kind of these three um, types of attacks, one being email, which we all know very well. Then you have the unpatched systems route, which can typically be driven from web attacks. I don't want to be too geeky on this call, so I'll try to steer away from how you do it. And then you have the brute force route, uh, which we see a lot of at the moment, as in a lot, a lot. So you guys should really be aware on your own systems. Do you have your firewalls on? We see a, not a lot of you actually do. So you might want to be aware of that. If you are interested, then do take a trial of the Handel firewall, which does have a, a brute force uh, protection mechanism built, built in. Uh, but that's very commonly exploited at the moment. If we, if we move on from that and take the, the more targeted function. So here you have two routes. Uh, one is the supply chain attack, which I certainly see unfolding heavily at the moment. So if you on this call are using an MSP, just be super mindful. That will lead to multiple uh, attack risks and kind of then the high profile route, um, which we're also seeing increasingly at the moment. So if you look in the news very frequently, uh, depending on what country you're from, so for the Danish people here on this call, uh, you'll notice the EDC attack recently uh, was one. If you go to the UK, uh, we had an NHS target being recently attacked. As uh, so you see some very high profile localized uh, businesses being attacked. Uh, and that's not necessarily for that individual target's reason, it's to create pressure when you get hit. Because if everybody in the country, I'm gonna to stick to the NHS example, if everybody in the UK knows that the NHA, that NHS got hit, uh, when you get hit by the same group, you're very likely to pay. And that's exactly, of course, what Europol, Interpol, uh, USDOJ are advising against. Don't pay the ransom. Uh, but you're more likely to pay. So that's what's happening. It's a PR exercise, basically. Um, let's move on from that. So that, of course, puts pressure, high pressure on uh, kind of MSPs again and MSSPs. You can certainly see some concentration going in there. They'll have trusted platforms, could be email relay platforms also being put under pressure. Uh, and then spinning off from that, uh, kind of also the the RMMs uh, being a, a prime target and cybersecurity platforms, even like Handel, will also be a prime target for a hacker, of course. If you then kind of unfold that into what we expect will happen in the uh, in the coming year or so, then clearly if you look at a market like a generative AI, uh, attackers also using that. So there's a high level of sophistication into how they try to compromise your account, but also with less, less effort on the attacker side. So you need to be really mindful that just like what Bottino showed, your adversary is also clever and they will also leverage systems that are uh, working for them at scale. Uh, so they can do it a lot faster, a lot simpler than they did before. They have more manpower than they had before and it's much better funded operation. Uh, so that of course also means that these orgs are working at a pace that you wouldn't believe, which of course again, then accelerates the need for automation on the customer and the MSP side. If we then move on from that, and we kind of take a, uh, we boil it all down and distill it into uh, a whiskey or a gin or whatever your guys' uh, preferences on the call, uh, what we think is uh, is kind of going to happen in the in the go forward uh, role. I'll, I'll pass it over to you, Andre, <laughs> here. 
Um, I, I, I just wanted to ask the audience uh, before we move forward, but again, we showed the question. I wanted to ask them if they know how much it costs to get access to one of those uh, hacking AI tools. It's just $200 per month. They even have a discount if you pay yearly. So uh, yeah, it's uh, it's it's that uh, it's that heavy. But sir, I believe that we should go uh, directly to your suggestions for 2024. Yeah, and sorry, sorry, I forgot you had your question baked in there. Apologies, Andre. <laughs> um, yeah, so on, on the on the predictions, since we're on we're on a roll, um, how, if we distill all that down, we make it into a gin or a whiskey. Um, clearly, you're going to get a very high alcohol percentage. Uh, it's going to be a very active 2024, I think. Uh, but then if you look at the predictions, clearly, and let's just roll it forward, actually, one, Andre, here. Um, I think that that's, that's helpful. So if you look at what, what we think is going to happen and what you guys should be doing uh, in terms of actions, if you look at what's going to happen, most likely MSPs are going to be an even more ripe target for next year. Um, if you look at also what's going to happen is most likely that there'll be a bigger prime target again next year around these high profile businesses. We had a uh, kind of interview stream going with uh, Danny, our head of content uh, last week, uh, where we kind of, uh, we spitballed around a bit and uh, kind of a funny, funny prediction could be that somebody would try to malware infect Tesla or something very high profile like that. That may be very well, kind of very far-fetched in normal thinking, but that type of thinking is what we need to realize that a hacker will deploy which will then kind of drive these trends for you as a customer. Um, so to, to defend against that, you will need to kind of consolidate your systems even further. Most people will have gone through 2023. Most of you on this call will have gone from, let's say about five to three protective systems to about one to two, uh, depending on the size of your business, of course. If it's very big, you might've had 20 and you're going down to, let's say six. Um, but there is a trend where you need to consolidate more. Um, for customers to get the maximum protection, you actually need to use the products that you do have. We still see quite a few customers not utilizing the platform that they have invested into. And then as the fallback of that, every single one of you on this call, I just like to Alex's point where he needed to jump off with, uh, with one of our customers again, I need to think about the fallback. If you don't have an incident response team or a SOC service standing by to help you today, that's certainly something you need to think about for 24. What do you do in the event that something does happen? Who do you call? Uh, how do you activate your, 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 your backups? How do you roll your backups in? Uh, these are all considerations that you guys should be having. <coughs> Thank you, Andre. I think we, uh, we covered all of it off um, on these points. Yes, we did, sir. And now we get to the interesting part with the Q&A, with the questions that people pre-submitted uh, for you. So how I actually did this, because there were like over 100 questions in total. So I actually boiled them down into a few categories. And I use actually ChatGPT to make the, to combine them so that we can uh, target more at the same time. So people might recognize their names, and this is only first names to avoid any type of, uh, of usage of ChatGPT or any fraud tools further. Uh, all these people's, uh, people ask questions about cyber attacks, especially ransomware and social engineering. And just to look at the questions, first one is, what are the trends you see in ransomware and social engineering? Yeah, I think I think we touched on some of that on this call really well. Uh, what you know showed the example uh, super well, I think. So we will see increasing complexity again. Everybody on this call, it's hard to translate into something you guys can use. Um, but I think people need to expect that the the sender on the other end of what you're receiving is now an AI. Um, it happens almost automatically. There won't be anybody sitting behind the screen uh, that you're interacting with. It's, it's probably a robot. Uh, so there's a high level of accuracy, it's a high velocity uh, and high complexity. Uh, and that, that's what we'll expect to see for ransomware attacks and social engineering uh, for, the, for the coming year, for sure. Perfect, the second question, what strategies, tools, and practices do you recommend for organizations to safeguard against ransomware attacks, social engineering, considering these trends that are going on right now with things going out of control 
Yeah, and this is of course a mega broad question, uh, but it's a great it's a great question for sure because this is of course the complexity that U.S. customers are facing, or even that an MSP would be facing. I mean, there's no doubt about my strategy here is it, it will be to get fewer tools on your hands, but then utilize the tools that you do have. So again, kind of leading into the unification, you cannot manage four, five, six, ten tools. It's impossible. You need to get things into the same platform. Uh, that might not be uh, in every single scenario it might not be the most optimal uh, but from a usage standpoint and defensive standpoint it will give you the best overall output for sure because you're going to be utilizing what you have rather than relying on the defensive product to do everything for you which it cannot it simply cannot do that yeah. uh, and that's mainly due to your input so you need to take the right boxes enable the right settings um, it won't do that out of the box so unification certainly uh, and then, of course, as it says here, kind of how do you protect against or safeguard against vulnerabilities? Well, again, if you utilize the products well, and these products do have a patch management component to them, for example, uh, email security component, et cetera, you will stave off a lot of these attacks at the front door, which has always been my recommendation. Uh, so that would be my strong suggestion. Perfect. Now, the question, que next question is about the budget, but I believe you already covered that. If we unify, we then reduce costs a lot. So uh, Yeah, I yeah that's true, Andre. And again, and it, all, it all goes hand in hand, for sure, as to, as to these trends we're seeing. And again, in a compressed economic climate, for sure, unification is a good answer to, um, to the, uh, the, the, the budget uh, question as well. Perfect. <laughs> now, we have one closer to home, so to say. How exposed are Nordic countries, especially Danish companies? Yeah, well, there's a lot of uh, Danish people on this call, but also a lot from uh, from other regions I see. Uh, well, I, I would say clearly the more income wealthy the country is, the more exposed it is. Denmark being, I believe, one of the richest countries in the in the world per capita, clearly it's, it's highly targeted. The advantage we do have in Denmark is it's small and there's a very specific language here that we use. So it's very hard to do targeted attacks on it, uh, which makes it less appealing. So uh, <laughs> and that applies for all the Nordic countries, by the way. So I'd say generally the Nordic countries are actually less exposed than their kind of income per capita would appeal to. But also why the UK we see is extremely exposed, has a good high income per capita, but uses a generic language, which all the AI bots know. Uh, makes it highly exposed. So uh, unfortunately for the UK, I think they're still going to be the prime target in, in Europe, and clearly the US will be globally the uh, the main target. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Now the next category of questions, it's about AI. And you can see all the people that asked uh, items about AI. Uh, how does AI impact cyber attacks and prevention, and what, regular use, what can regular users do to stop AI-generated threats? Yeah, that, that's of course really hard. I mean, Heimdall in itself uh, uses a number of AI algorithms to to do prevention. Uh, so certainly we of course recommend that you try to do your due diligence, ask your vendors what did they use, what did they leverage. Stopping as a user without a protected product, stopping AI attacks, that's going to be incredibly hard. You basically wouldn't know uh, it's an AI at the other end, uh, given the complexity of the AI today. So you need to rely on getting a very strong protective product uh, available for you, for sure. Thank you, sir. How is AI integrated in Heimdall now and what are the future plans? Yeah, so we have two patents pending uh, where we're actually using what is called kind of full-blown AI. And then we have a number of algorithms, et cetera, we also use across uh, the customer base to, uh, to do protection. Um, and that's clearly a, a route we continue to undertake. Uh, we were one of the we were the first out with AI for uh, DNS. Uh, we're still the only ones out, I think, with AI for DNS. And we recently rolled out an AI for our email fraud uh, component. There are certainly more coming in the pipeline, uh, spinning specifically around malware uh, and how you detect the the reactive component. Uh, so it's it's heavily in the plan for sure for the coming years as well. Thank you, sir. What about beyond uh, regular AI? Any consideration of quantum computing in the future? Well, you can say the, with, with the amount of servers we use and the way we utilize AI, it requires a heavy degree of, uh, of computation. Uh, quantum computing is actually just a bigger computer than a normal one. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a matter of how many cores you actually use. 
in that regard, I'd say we already use quantum computing, not specifically to the AI and ML, but certainly for the protection services of the customers uh, across the board. Thank you, sir. A lot of people, lots of people are asking for some specific things. I'm mentioning this for everybody right now. There's a QR code at the end where you can book a meeting with me. I can take you through these algorithms and all of these things. Just wanted to put that out there. Now we have a Heimdall console slide placed in case you need it for explanation, sir, but we will move forward. And these are some questions about the Heimdall product stack. And by the way, I hope everybody saw the chat message. We hope you can spend a few more minutes with us uh, so that we can go through all of these questions. Thank you. Okay, Heimdall product stack. Why should someone pick Heimdall versus other vendors? What you're, you're giving me some, you're great, giving me some great questions where I have to throw somebody under the bus. Uh, well, I think the advantage with the Heimdall stack, as we kind of touched on, I think it was you, Andre, who called it out very early in this call. It's wider than any other vendor. Uh, so I think the main reason you'd go with Heimdall is it's the widest stack that you can get in one place, which brings a lot of benefits with it. Uh, so that's why I would mainly say you go with Heimdall versus, say, in this example, CrowdStrike or Sentinel-1, uh, for sure. It, it, it brings many benefits with it that you would outweigh uh, whatever downsides you'd find in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the Heimdall platform, simply because it's wider, you get everything unified, and all the modules are intertwined. And the fact that the modules are intertwined is exactly why uh, this example for, uh, that, um, that Alex had with the isolation on Tamber, that when a machine gets compromised, if somebody starts tingling with the defensive capability, you can, for example, isolate it because we integrate with the firewall, we integrate with the, uh, with the defensive and reactive mechanisms on the machine. And you can't do that unless you have this kind of wide platform in there. Thank you so I'll much, try to sir. make them shorter. I'm mindful of the time. I see we only have three minutes left. So, uh... no worries. Uh, I, I think I believe we can step. Uh, we can uh, go over this one with Microsoft. Uh, quick uh, I think that that's actually super interesting. Let's take that one with Microsoft. Let's go back that, to that one. Let's Why? go back to that one. How is I think addressing I... the, the Microsoft security one-stop shop type of approach? Yeah, on, on this call, I would certainly say to everybody on the call, you need to be aware that Handle uh, as a vendor, uh, I wouldn't say against Microsoft, but alongside Microsoft or in alternative to Microsoft, depends on how you're thinking about it, is a much cheaper, more complex, more advanced solution than what Microsoft is offering. Again, because all the Handle modules are integrated. So if you're looking for value for money in a condensed uh, economic climate, which we're having at the moment, you'll get a lot more value for money and better protection from a handle stack than a Microsoft E5, for example, which would be your only alternative. Uh, and you need to remember that the Microsoft stack is disparate. It's not integrated across the modules. Yet. So it doesn't work from one module to the other. You need to log out of one piece of Microsoft, log into another, et cetera everything in Handel comes kind of integrated. So an E3 with Handel on top is much more bang for the buck than a Microsoft E5. Thank you, sir. Now, the last one, super interesting. Why don't we see this in Gartner Magic Quadrant or in the Wave by Forrester? Yeah, and the reason for that is simply that, uh, as you can hear many times, I had these discussions with Gartner. I typically tend to find that Gartner is not that visionary. It works very reactively off the market. Uh, so before Gardner forms an opinion, they form a survey with the customer, which clearly is not very visionary uh, in the sense that it comes after the fact. So everything Gardner does comes after the fact, uh, and then clearly we're not willing to pay for getting into an MQ where you need to, to pay for getting into a service where people are not visionary about it. Um, but that's probably just me being stubborn. And similarly with the force of wave, Again, people need to remember Gardner, this is not on Forrester, but Gardner specifically said uh, until recently, go with best of breed. And I'm, I'm talking up until kind of early 22, go with best of breed. And that's what you need to do. And all of a sudden it turned around on the plate and go with unification, which is exactly what Handel has been trying to build since uh, 2020. So it's a very different route of being visionary as opposed to being non-visionary and reactive. Let's put it like that. That's more of a reactive approach. I, I, I totally wanted to say that, but you stole the word. Uh, now, I believe that we can sum up the next questions in just one main question. What's Heimdall going to do next so that we can actually still become, uh, still stay competitive in the next gen 
XDR Arena. What are the yeah. plans for the future? Yeah, yeah. So what we have a very visionary platform today. Clearly, the the tag portal has been quite mind blowing for a lot of people uh, because it brings together. So for those who haven't seen it, we should certainly do another webinar on the on the tag portal. But it, it's basically a console that allows consolidation of all the security data into one platform, and then you can action it in one place. Provides a very unparalleled overview of your security state. Um, that will certainly amplify in 2024, but then we'll continue to kind of launch new features. And we specifically have yeah, some of these on the screen as well. Yes, we have BitLocker management coming out. Email security enhancements have been coming out in multiple folds recently. Uh, but then also uh, we're launching a, a what is called a PA and SM tool very shortly uh, for the kind of more complex um, administrative users. PA and SM is privileged account and session management. So it'll allow you to launch sessions into servers, just what is called just in time. Uh, our sales team can certainly help you with, uh, with more information as we expect that to come out in early 24. Those are probably the main themes, Andre. More technology for our Mac, et cetera, will also be coming out uh, for sure as well. Perfect. Thank you so much, sir. Now, I know that we're over time. We still have some general cybersecurity questions, which if you guys are still curious about these, I'm going to tell you the best way to get them uh, answered in just one second. The next webinar, you guys usually know, I tell you what the next webinar is. We're going to start 2024 with a bang. We're going to have a guest, a virtual CISO, which is a CISO for multiple companies, right? Telling us what's her blueprint for cybersecurity success. And now, how will you get your cybersecurity general questions uh, to uh, answer? Book this meeting with me, a 30 minutes meeting, no obligations. A lot of people want to talk about the algorithms, want to talk about uh, a settings review, uh, more questions about a virus I saw in the chat. So guys, just book a meeting. Uh, you can specify there what exactly do you want to talk about, and we will take care of it. It's going to be personally with me. And we do wish you a safe 2024. Now, if anyone, anybody wants to still uh, push a question, this would be the moment. We still have one minute maximum. So how do we use Heimdall itself to narrow down which type of alert and the file, the find the app that might contain mm -hmm. the malware? Malware pattern, ATP strain, for probability of infection high. Eric, I know what you're talking about. You're talking about the vector and the AI detection in the DNS. Book a session with me and we will interpret that together, okay? Uh, and we will look at that your specific case. Uh, Raul saying simple email also okay. Of course, Raul, an email goes out to everybody that participates in the in the meeting, and you guys will be able to book the meeting that way. Somebody saying the QR is no longer valid. No worries. The email will send you the meeting uh, the meeting um, link, and we will check it out. So thank you so so much for staying with us. There's we're already five minutes after uh, five minutes after the hour, which means that you guys enjoyed the session because. 90% of you are still here, which is amazing. Any last words from my colleagues to the audience? No, just thank you for listening today. I think it's, uh, I, I hope it's been super valuable. Uh, lots of talking, but also we try to show some real life examples of how you can uh, work with the product uh, and how we can deliver value to you. So uh, yeah, hope, hopefully valuable. And thank you for listening in uh, today. Thank you, everybody. Robertino? Just thank you because Robertino has a back to back meeting. He's right now leaving the webinar. Gentlemen, uh, take care. And Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas, everybody. Don't... <laughs> Merry Christmas, everybody. Yeah, indeed. Again, thank you for joining us. And in case you do want to talk, you know how to contact me. And uh, if not, just respond to that email that you get after the webinar. Have a safe 2024. Bye bye.